Howdy! My name is Karok Ray and I am the director of the Mays Innovation Research Center. Welcome to our YouTube talk show, Innovation Matters. Just to give you a ba some way, by way of background, the Mays Innovation Research Center is an academic center here at Texas A&M University dedicated to understanding the true nature of innovation. We fund research, host conferences, and host a lot of events, including this one, where we talk about some of the latest trends in innovation from uh, prominent Aggie innovators. Today, we are blessed to have Eric Schlumpf visit us from uh, Stewart, Florida. Uh, and he is a, uh, a graduate of our co College of, Electri of Engineering, where yeah, he studied electrical right. engineering. And uh, he's also the CEO and founder of Stewart Therapeutics. That's right. So, uh, Eric, welcome to our show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. I really appreciate it. Great. So, so I wanted to. You're actually our first uh, speaker in the the health and uh, biosciences okay. area Great. and life sciences. But I understand you've had a very varied career. I have. I've done a lot of different things. My wife says I'm bored easy. So that's that's probably what drove it. Um, yeah, I um, I had a great time at A and M, and I studied engineering, and uh, it was a challenging um, coursework for me, and I I got through it fine, and started engineering, and realized that I wanted to do something very different, and I started doing a lot of different things. But the first career opportunity I had was with Motorola in Fort Worth, and we were doing a lot of new things with, you know, it was the first time microprocessors got used in consumer and uh, industrial electronics. So we were doing some interesting programming things with the new microprocessors that were out at the time. That dates me, thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I looked around, I decided that I really wanted something that had more um, involvement outside of an engineering lab. And I wanted to get away from that type of work. And I started uh, seeking new opportunities and I got on with a company in Dallas that was um, in an acquisitive mode. Uh, at the time, that was when companies were diversifying and adding new types of business units to their portfolio, broadening their scope of business. And it allowed me to get involved in a variety of different acquisitions, which was an interesting training for me as a former engineering student and now a graduate business uh, student. Ultimately, it led me into the waste industry. So I got involved oh. in uh, waste disposal, toxic waste, Superfund cleanup. Huh. And uh, that was a great learning experience uh, in and of itself. In California? Is yeah, that right? it ultimately ended up in California, did some here in the Midwest in Oklahoma and in Texas. And it was um, it was kind of an interesting lesson because when you're in the waste industry, you learn what everybody gets rid of, which is a nice way to learn about how businesses work in some sure, respects. Sure. But um, a lot of interesting technology, a lot of innovation uh, to the topic of today's discussion in that world. Um, we came up with new service opportunities, new ways of dealing with uh, areas of concern for cities and county and state governments, and uh, enjoyed that a lot. Um, and got from there into the uh, consulting industry, started a new consulting indus uh, industry participant and uh, developed that business from a, from a starting, uh, starting point and, uh, with a lot of colleagues, a lot of very good colleagues that are still friends to this day. On to T-Mobile where I tried to do innovation in a large company setting and then right. now I'm in the health, uh, health and uh, uh, medicine area and uh, biotech company that's doing some really good things. And, wow, so, so you've really seen multiple, multiple yeah, industries. I have, yeah. I have. Uh, let's let's first start, I guess, with your most recent. Uh, right. and how, tell me about the transition uh, from, I guess, T-Mobile was your last uh, last industry. Last big last big company. Big I did company. a turn in a laboratory business doing uh, healthcare delivery in Southern California before, so I got used to the life sciences world and uh, pathology and that sort of thing uh -huh. in Southern California. But the uh, the venture that we started in uh, Florida was the first time in drug development, and it's a very, very different business. Right, to be in. Yeah. right. Okay, so tell me about that. Like, yeah. like, how did you make that transition? You became an entrepreneur. Yeah, I, right? well, I, For, we, the the uh, transition into the uh, into medicine uh, and in uh, drug development happened uh, through failure. We had a uh, my business partner and I were trying to do a uh, a roll up or a buy up of a number of different companies in um, the wound dressing business. They're, 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 it's a very basic business that deals with diabetic uh, wound care. And uh, we failed for a variety of different reasons uh, to pull it off. Yeah. And as we were looking around at the research that we'd done prior to getting into that, we uh, identified another opportunity that we had set aside. And that opportunity was to license a technology that had been developed at the University of Wisconsin. 
and then develop it as a series of drug, uh, d uh, drug opportunities, primarily for ophthalmology, which is what Stewart Therapeutics is all about. Uh -huh. And uh, it's been, um, uh, they always say this sort of thing is like drinking through the fire hose. It's definitely been that. You learn a lot about the science involved. You learn about the medicine and the clinical activities involved in the care of patients with these diseases of the eye. And then you're also trying to assess the commercial opportunity and how to develop the drug in such a way that you can do it efficiently from uh -huh. a capital perspective, fast enough that you capture the opportunity and um, in a way that develops a market opportunity for your investors. So that's what we've been about for the last four years. Wow, wow. Yeah. And um, so uh, then tell me, tell me the, uh, I guess, how did, it, how did you come to Stewart, Florida? How, how, sure. was, how was that? What? Yeah, no, I had, I had gotten to know uh, my business partner today, yeah. uh, Dr. Barada in South Florida through uh, introduction from a friend. And we'd been talking about different businesses to get involved in. And uh, he and I focused on that wound care opportunity first uh -huh. and foremost. And it was timely for us. My wife's uh, parents were reaching the end of their life and right. we needed to get to uh, Florida to uh, try to lend a hand and to help manage some of those affairs. And okay. uh, that led us to South Florida. So a little bit of necessity, a little bit of opportunity, right, but um, right. it worked out nicely for us, and we we love where we live. Stewart, Florida is a great town. It's great. been a good place. Great. And uh, tell me about your your company. So what exactly do you do? And, sure. Uh, maybe we go into some detail. On yeah, it. yeah. We're we're developing a new, um, a very new uh, technology for the treatment of disease, uh, based upon that technology we licensed from the University of Wisconsin, and yeah. it's. Um, the first that we're aware of uh, drug that targets the interstitial tissues, the collagen and the, the tissues in between the cells, uh -huh. uh, because they play a role in keeping the body healthy. And as we age, they start to decline in their effectiveness. Yeah. And we have, a, we have a platform technology that is a direct reparative of those tissues. So we can intervene in chronic inflammatory diseases. And we chose to pursue diseases of the eye, uh, first uh, diseases of the ocular surface like dry eye disease. And the second drug candidate we have is for glaucoma, which is an inflammatory uh, disease that's manifested by increased pressure in the eye. Uh -huh. And uh, the company has um, fit, completed its first phase two trial very successfully for uh -huh. the topical drop that we're using for dry eye disease. That happened last fall uh -huh. and uh, we're uh, pursuing the Glaucoma project uh, just as rapidly as we possibly can as well. So it's it's gone it's gone quite nicely. The company's got uh, six employees. It's uh, we're small and we like to keep it small. Yeah. Uh, we run virtually. We have an office in Stewart, Florida, and we have people uh, throughout the Eastern United States that work for us. Uh -huh. And it's uh, you can't do this kind of stuff without a very strong team. And, sure. and the team comes together. We've got I've got colleagues that manage our suppliers that help us run the trials. I've got colleagues that are that deal with patent and legal issues as well as research and program design. We've got, uh, I've got colleagues that deal with our um, uh, experiment design because yeah. you're constantly creating proof points for your technology yeah, to show yeah. that it works and how it works, yeah. uh, particularly something new like this. So that's, that's what we're up to today. Is the end product, will it be eye drops or a drug? Uh, the or? first drug uh, end product will be a topical drop. Yeah, an uh -huh. eye drop uh, that will be sold um, to, we hope, to patients around the world. Right. Uh, the next product is likely going to be an injection into the eye, an inter what's known as an intravitreal injection. Into the eye? Into the eye. That That's sounds right. painful. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, when you're, uh, there are a lot of drugs that are injected into the eye today for things like wet macular degeneration. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and you've got... Uh, uh, other diseases of the back of the eye where in, uh, injections are quite common. They're infrequent. You, yeah. you don't want to do them every day, but yeah, uh, yeah. about once a quarter, or once every few months, patients routinely go in for these and it's a regularly accepted procedure. I see. I see. Yeah. Now, the genesis of this innovation... But your reaction is just like everybody else. Oh, is that so, right? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've had glasses my whole life and yeah. I'm always sensitive about my eyes, yeah. Plus allergies. Yes, <laughs> Uh, so the genesis of this innovation was, uh, it came out of the University of Wisconsin, That's is that right? right? How, yeah. how did you uh, identify that? And what well, our, our aborted business attempt at a roll-up of wound care companies revolved around um, uh, basically bovine collagen, powdered bovine collagen. Uh -huh. So um, diabetic wounds, not the most pleasant topic in the world, but they have a hard time healing. Uh -huh. And... Uh, these patients have to oftentimes go to wound care facilities and they get the, the wound is 
scrape to get dead tissue out and then they put the bovine collagen in to help provide a scaffold or, a, or something for the tissues to adhere to as they recover. Right, right. And uh, we were doing research on uh, synthetic versions of uh -huh. collagen uh -huh. and uh, had kind of put that aside while we pursued the roll up. And when we realized that that wasn't gonna happen, we went back to that technology that we'd identified uh -huh. and said, let's talk to the folks involved in this and let's understand this at a deeper level. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. what we determined was that uh, this was something that had great applicability in a lot of different areas of medicine. Uh -huh. It could be a platform technology. It was completely unique in terms of its mechanism of action, which is a big thing in the drug business. Everybody yeah. wants to know what's the mechanism by yeah. which it works. And we um, decided that we wanted to grab the license to it. So we grabbed uh -huh. the license and then we created Stuart Therapeutics to start in the eye. Uh -huh. And um, our plan was always to get Stuart to a point where we could uh, sell the company or license the technologies out and then go pursue this technology in other areas of uh, okay. uh, medicine. So okay. there are opportunities in skin diseases, pulmonary uh, conditions, um, central nervous system challenges, um, stroke, right. um, and orthopedic opportunities as well. So there's a host of different opportunities for this technology that we hope to capitalize upon over the next several years. So is it fair to say that you are you, you guys are successfully commercializing some university uh, research? Is yeah, we hope right? we hope so. We've successfully completed a phase two trial in humans, yeah. which is a big step for any drug development company. Yeah. Um, and that to that extent, we've been successful. Obviously, the uh, approval process for any drug with the Food and Drug Administration right. is a arduous one, and we're in the middle of that right now. Yeah. Uh, but we believe that we've got uh, everything it takes to be successful at that with this particular wow. first drug candidate and others behind it, yes. And how, how involved is that original, uh, I guess, principal investigator at this stage? Is, is, is it, is he's, you know, he's moved on from Wisconsin, uh, uh, Professor Ron Raines. He's a very notable uh, and famous chemist around the world. He's now at MIT, uh -huh, and uh -huh. uh, he's an investor in our company, uh -huh, uh -huh. And is, um, uh, but he's not been involved on a day-to-day -day basis. We've kind of taken it and run with it. Yeah. He was more interested, I think, in it, and I hope not to uh, uh, not to sell him short here, but I think he was more interested in it as the from a from a chemistry perspective and sure. being able to demonstrate that he could create this mimic of a part of collagen uh -huh. in uh -huh. a way that was beneficial. We've kind of taken it and run with it in terms of its clinical application, sort of the translation translational research side of things. Sure. So when you take a basic science project and identify ways that you can use it to benefit people. Right. That's what we're about. And I, I think see. that's what we're very good at. Okay. Uh, we'd be horrible basic researchers, but we're pretty good, uh -huh. I think, at this. Uh, do you have any, uh, j just given that you've, you're living this right now, yeah. uh, what's your uh, insights or views on this, this, this kind of issue of commercialization out of, out of higher education? Things that are working, okay. things that yeah. are broken that could be fixed. What just what thoughts do you oh, have? Oh boy, that could go on for a long time. <laughs> um, I would say we have a fabulous partner in the University of Wisconsin. They've got something called the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which is responsible for licensing technologies, and they've got a very open way of dealing with that sort of technology transfer. Um, I would say there are a lot of universities, major name universities in the United States that do not have that kind of open-minded approach uh -huh. to uh -huh. technology transfer and their expectations about the value of the technology that sits on their shelf in terms of value is um, much higher than it should be. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. it, they make it extremely difficult for companies to acquire and then usefully develop that technology. So right. that's, that's one thing that I right. think is worth folks thinking about in the university setting is how easy are we to work with for industry? Uh -huh. um, doesn't mean you have to give everything away, but right. you need to manage expectations, I sure. think. That's one thing. Sure. Um, I think having um, efficient and effective um, legal counsel and professional legal team to negotiate these agreements is, is uh, something else that I would say is a big stumbling block. There's it sometimes takes us months to negotiate transfer agreements or updates to licenses and so forth, and it shouldn't have to take that right, long. Right. Um, it's, it's, if you have legal counsel managing technology transfer, they should be business-oriented legal counsel, yeah. not bureaucratic-oriented right. legal counsel. Right, and right, that's, right. You know, that's not um, unique to this area, but it's an area of yeah. difficulty for companies trying to do technology transfer. Um, and I think the other thing is outreach, um, because no one knows what's on the shelves at these universities oftentimes, yeah, yeah. and you, unless you're looking for it, yeah. oftentimes you don't find it. Yeah, yeah. And universities 
sometimes aren't the, no, the best people to sponsor development themselves, and it's better right. in the hands of folks that do that sort of thing for a living. So right. uh, making it known is another piece, I think. Right. Those are probably the three things off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, to, uh, just to loop everyone in, and university commercialization is a huge area. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat complicated. Yeah. It's a little bit of a niche area unless you're kind of knee-deep in it. Um, I tend to know a little bit about it because we're, you know, here at A&M, right. uh, we're a major research university. Right. We have a billion dollars of research flowing through our campus. And commercialization has been a challenge uh, for, for our campus. Right. It's been uh, bureaucratically kind of reshuffled over the years. Yeah. Uh, and I think there, those points that you just raised have been common in our own experience yeah. where right. I think historically there's been more of a, a legal bureaucratic mindset rather than a biz, pro-business mindset. Right. And right. That can, Hamper, I think, uh, outcomes. I think the thing that I found most um, exciting about the folks at um, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation is there's a true business uh, partnership mentality. They're right. actually an investor right. in our company. They, right. they look for opportunities to invest in the technologies that they are licensing out. Um, I think they take a, a venture capital mentality uh -huh. to that opportunity, uh -huh. and it's a good one. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that combining those two things can... If you can navigate all of the different potential conflicts and issues in all of that, which they seem to do an excellent job of, I think that's a that's a great way to capitalize on what has got to be a large body of very, very good opportunities right. here at the university. Right. That's great. Uh, speaking on this topic of bureaucracy, tell, yes. tell yeah. me what, what, what is it like working with the FDA? I mean... Uh, do you recommend that, or is, is it... well, that's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, well. My experience with the FDA directly has been through Stewart, and that means our experiences with the ophthalmology and transplant division of FDA, and the people that lead that group are really, really good folks. Um, I think the the thing, that, and I, I got this early in my career when I was in the waste industry because many of my customers were city and county and state yeah. government people, and or federal. And yeah. I think that um, once you understand that their, uh, what drives them and what their objectives are, are not the same things that drive industry, right. then you can try to find common ground and you right. can try to understand what makes sense. Um, if you go at it from a zero sum game perspective, you will lose every time and it will, it's not gonna be fun. Yeah. And I think what I've found is that there's an open-mindedness to new things uh, at FDA. There's a willingness to consider things if they're founded by, the, by good scientific data and um, they're willing to uh, consider uh, opportunities to, to help patients out. I think they care very much that you demonstrate what you're doing is safe yeah. and, that, um, uh, and that you can do it in such a way that uh, patients aren't gonna be disadvantaged. And I think if you can get there, you're, you're, you're gonna be fine. Uh -huh. So I, I, haven't had that, I haven't had a hard time with the FDA uh, at all. I, I have a lot of stories about the state of California and my early experience in the waste industry that weren't quite so pleasant, but that uh -huh. was when I was learning. So. Um, uh -huh. Maybe I'm better now. Okay, so yeah. so uh, you know, the, I guess the the criticism that I've I've heard, uh, I'm no expert in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, with the FDA, is they're like, sometimes adopt an overly risk averse or cautious approach, and they're slow to actually encourage innovation. Uh, yeah, the, I yeah, I think that, that they would. No, I don't. I don't, I think that's one of those things where that's a difference of objectives. Yeah. So um, as Stewart Therapeutics, my objective is to innovate yeah. and to bring new technologies to patients to help them. Uh, in the FDA, their regulatory brief is to make sure that uh, that patients are safe right. and that things aren't that the things that they're delivered aren't harmful. Yeah. And I think that uh, if we're if we're looking at when they say no to something, either there's probably a lack of scientific foundation for what's being asked for, or there's concerns about the safety protocol that's been offered up, or any number of other areas that are related to the patient. And I'm not going to suggest that the FDA is uh, blameless in any of the um, conflicts or issues that happen on a day-to-day -day basis between drug companies trying to advance technology and them trying to protect the public. But it doesn't seem to me that their objective or their, uh, or their brief is to stand in the way of innovation. Uh -huh. And I think we've seen them acting quite flexibly over the last uh, 36 months as we've gone through the, uh, the pandemic with COVID and so forth. So okay. there's been, they, they, there are a lot of opportunities for industry and the federal government to work together effectively, yeah, uh, yeah. but got to recognize the difference in goals. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so what, what's the next stage for you, for your company? Tell us yeah. Us so, we're, so we're so um, we're involved in a process of uh, engaging with potential strategic partners 
uh, regarding the first drug candidate and our follow-on candidate for glaucoma as well uh, to see if there's interest in uh, licensing our technology or perhaps acquiring the company. Uh, we are preparing for our first phase three trial for the dry eye drug. Uh, that is uh, likely going to happen at the beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some preparatory work to do on that. And then uh, the next steps after the phase three, uh, subject to um, FDA approval of each of the steps is for us to file what's called a new drug authorization package and then commercialize the drug or work with a partner to do that. Okay, so, and, and what, what, let me ask you, mm -hmm. just for people who may not know, including myself, what is the uh, kind of the acquisition timetable in an industry like yours where you're dealing right. with, with clinical trials? Right. When is when is that time? When's, it, when's it typically take place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kinda, when is that typically? Sort of between now and the end of the phase three trial oh, is typical for dr uh -huh. for companies in our industry. There's um, there's there's a trend in our industry where the larger drug companies um, basically look at companies like ourselves as the farm teams, right? right so we're right. developing the players, and sure. when they get mature, then they want to grab them and take right. them into the big leagues. Right, and, right, right. Uh, I think our um, our intent all along was because we have the rights to this technology for other areas of medicine that we want to be in a position to get this to a proof point, uh, make a deal or some deals with other companies, uh -huh. and then move on to other areas of medicine. And that's uh, we'd we'd like to be able to execute that plan. Okay. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Well. Well. Uh, that sounds like you're on track. I <laughs> hope so. I hope so. We'll see. This yeah. year will be telling. Yeah. 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 And then uh, w w let's say assuming that's successful, then mm -hmm. you would. Uh, uh, if it's licensed out, you would. What involvement would you have, or your company have? In the yeah, post -acquisition yeah. A lot of that depends upon the type of license, because you can yeah. do co-development deals, you can do license deals, you can get acquired. Uh, yeah. You know, to the extent that the other company wants to uh, take responsibility for the program, our involvement would be watching the books, uh -huh. maintaining observation status on the program and yeah. and uh, uh, audit uh, of the uh, financials downstream if we were fortunate enough to get approval on royalties. Right. Uh, in other cases, a partner might not have strong capability in a particular area and they'd want us to continue to develop the program while they sponsored it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's really just highly dependent upon the partner. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Great. And after, uh, assuming, assuming, assuming you do have a successful outcome, you said you'd like, you'd like to move away from the eye to other, other body parts or yeah, I, I stay think in the, therapeutics? Yeah. The, the technology in our industry is called a platform technology. And all that means is that there's a basic design of, uh, something that ends up be, being multiple different drug substances. So the drug substances that we've identified for the eye are, uh, appear to work very, very well, either in humans or in the case of the glaucoma acid in our preclinical animal studies. We would uh, utilize other um, variants of this platform in other areas of medicine. So we, we see opportunity in uh, pulmonary disease, in uh, orthopedic uh, uh, issues like um, uh, repairing uh, damaged tissues in knees and shoulders. We see opportunities in uh, central nervous system uh, areas such as stroke and, uh -huh. and that type of thing, and digestive diseases, and the list goes on. Basically, the, the one interesting thing about the platform is that interstitial tissues, collagen is throughout the body. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's, a, it's a, a very widespread, and diseases that affect it are numerous. So we have multiple opportunities to develop this to help patients in different ways for different types of diseases. Uh, and and that's really exciting to us. That's something that we want to try to create. And that would still come from the same IP intellectual property. Same IP. Same yeah, IP. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. So and we structured Stuart where it had the exclusive rights to the technology and ophthalmology. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. we could get that first proof point. And uh -huh. uh, the trial phase two trial last fall was that first proof point in humans, which right. was a great a great thing to get done. And that IP is patent backed. I'm guessing. It patents, yeah, they're patents that we've licensed. We've also uh, filed some patents of our own uh, uh -huh. to surround the uh, IP estate and give us additional protections and continue uh -huh. to do so to this uh -huh. day. Uh -huh. So you have a research team on your staff? Is we do. Right? Um, yeah, I, we've got um, a good relationships with outside researchers. We have uh, very experienced um, team members who are um, uh, done a lot of work in collagen, uh, collagen and collagen science on uh -huh. our team. Uh, we've got... Um, Clinical background on our team. My uh, uh -huh. my one of my business partners is a longtime ophthalmologist and uh -huh. uh, very savvy with respect to uh, 
how physicians look at new drugs and how physicians accept new drugs uh, in the treatment of patients. Uh, and we've got folks that are very, very skilled at the management of uh, our supporting contracts and our vendors and in uh, the development of the business overall. Okay, okay, yeah. great, great. Uh, now let me let me pivot a little bit and talk uh, more, I guess, the personal side. I'm, I'm okay. a labor economist, so I'm, I'm most interested in skills and human right. capital. Right. Um, did you, uh, you know, I guess, uh, Tell me about your, both from your education to your work experience, what has been the most useful to you in your current uh, role as kind of a founder and CEO of a, of a drug, drug company? Uh, well, I, well, there are a couple of things. I guess if I go way, way back, uh, my dad is an inspiration to me. My dad yeah. kind of taught me that don't give up kind of mentality. Uh, yeah. He was in the space program. And as a contractor in the space program, you kind of had the boom bust, the hire, work for a while, get laid off when the program ends, wait for the next program or find a job with another contractor right. kind of thing. And I think he was doing what he loved. I mean, he was an aeronautical engineer and he loved the work he was doing in the Apollo and Gemini and space shuttle programs, but it was, you know, turbulent sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of learned the don't give up uh, from him. And that's been important to me because um, innovation is one of those things you can, you, you get pushed down a lot. There's a lot of negative right. things that happen when you're trying to do that. And the opportunity to be able to be successful in that requires you to have a pretty thick skin. Yeah. So that, I think, was important. I think um, another thing that was important to me, and I learned it here at A&M, was um, hard work and um, learning to surround a problem. Uh, because I, I think when I got here, I was probably not as well prepared as I should have been for an electrical engineering degree. And uh, I struggled. Uh, I ended up buying two or three different textbooks for some of the classes sure. that I took to try to understand it. Um, it kind of gave me a discipline of getting up very early in the morning to sure. you know, work the first three hours of the yeah. day before anybody else got going. And I think that that, um, that mentality about surrounding a problem and, and finding creative and different ways to, to understand all of the elements of it was pretty valuable to me. And I think it probably helped me be successful in different industries. Um, I think those are those are key, and I think there's some social and and uh, people skill related things as well. Uh, you 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 have to understand it's a team effort. Uh, the the folks that I work with Brian Del Buno, Sean Delory, Bob Barada, David Calkins, uh Greg Barada, all really talented people, and having those people around me and being able to bounce ideas off of them in a way with you know with some humility. Yeah. Helps you get the helps you get the job accomplished in yeah. a better way. It really does. Now you you are uh, <coughs> again a founder and CEO of a drug a drug startup company, yeah. uh, but you don't have formal training yourself in no. medicine. T tell tell us, I guess, for that student in the audience yeah. who wants to do the same thing, well, uh, why should he not be scared? He or she not be scared? How, how can you? Well, if I had to do it by myself, I'd be scared. Yeah. Uh, I've got a I've got a doctor who sits next door to me, right. so I just stick my head out the door and I say, "Hey, Bob, what is this?" Or, "Hey, Bob, do you, is this right?" And right. that that's easy. That's effective, right? right. That right. that's that gives you immediate feedback. Um, I think. Well, I go back to that sort of get up at four thirty every morning kind of thing, and I can't tell you how many uh, scientific uh, research papers I've read or, yeah. or that kind of thing to try to get a handle on what's going on in right. medicine in a particular disease indication, uh, what's happening in the various types of tissues and cells in the body and how they interact. Um, you know, it's been you know two or three graduate degrees in four years trying right. to try, trying to understand all that, and right. I think it's. Um, there's a hard work element to, to doing this kind of thing. And yeah. if you really want to be an innovator, if you really want to do the new thing, yeah. um, you have to be willing to work really hard. Yeah. And um, there's no easy path on that. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons, one of two big reasons why it doesn't happen as often in large companies. Yeah. Um, there's less, there's more structure, so people are more structured in their day, so that extra work time doesn't seem to get applied. And I think there's also a lot of um, status quo or um, uh, maintaining the current thing that goes on in large sure. organizations, and sure. everybody's comfortable, right? Yep, it's yep, yep, it's yep. not a it's not an activity for people who want to be comfortable. That's right. So that's I right. think I think that's probably what's driven it more than anything else. So so how do you how do you tell us how you personally manage all kind of the um, how you kind of shock the system and stay optimistic when. The status quo is so easy yeah. and, and people are kind of, you know, innovation requires kind of yeah. a force a force of nature. Yeah, well, and I... What mental tricks do you use? Or? Well, it to, to me, it was, I'm a person of faith and I think that uh, what's useful to me is knowing that there's, you know, there's God out there 
I'm good. Whatever happens here is going to be fine. Yeah. And if I use, if I if I really believe that, then I'm going to be successful at what I do. Yeah. And uh, whatever it is, it might not be this thing. It might be the next thing that I do, but it, it's going to happen. It's, yeah. Things are going to be fine. And I think that that also gives me confidence that if I'm a, I'm in a, I'm in a place for a reason, I'm doing what I'm doing for a reason. And I think that that's also very important to remember. You're there to lead something. You're placed there to lead something. You're placed there to be responsible for something. You're placed there to help overcome um, cynicism or negative attitudes or help get past failures because you're going to have failures. We've yeah. had failures in our organization. We've had yeah. things that have gone wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you just say, well, it went wrong, we give up, then you don't get anywhere. I mean, Edison is a perfect example of a right. guy that was, I mean, he was more brute force than I am. But, uh, you know, he's a guy that just kept cranking. And he got there and he figured out a light bulb. And it took him right. hundreds of tries, but he got there, right? right? And I think that having that mentality about innovation, that it's hard work, you're going to fail, you're going to have challenges, you have to have a mentality to overcome cynicism yeah. and, and um, negativity, I, I think it's, cru I think yeah. it's critical. Yeah. If you can't do those things... You, when you're faced with the first challenge, you're going to turn and run. Right. That's so. right. Yeah. Well, your comment about Edison reminds me of a, a book I'm reading right now called Invention by uh, by James Dyson, right. who, who made the yep. Dyson vacuum right. cleaner. And yep. He ha he made five thousand prototypes to get to that one yep. vacuum cleaner. And, I could see it. And everyone thought he was crazy for caring so much about suction. Yeah. <laughs> but right. uh, but you know he did, and and uh, <laughs> and he's and, and he's done well with he's it. Done well he's with done it. well exactly with it. Right. Yeah. No That's doubt. Right. No doubt. Uh, now, in your, across your career in all these different uh, industries and, and jobs you've had, uh, which, which, in your opinion, has been the most conducive for innovation uh, and which has been the worst? I, guess. I think, uh, well, you, you can classify them in a number of different ways. So smaller organizations, much more conducive to innovation. Yeah. Um, you have more degrees of freedom, yeah. uh, you know, obviously subject to funding. Funding drives a lot of things. Yeah. Um, Larger organizations, there's um, people get invested in organizational structures, roles, right. responsibilities, right. the whole discipline of management consulting and putting people into processes and everybody right. has to plug into those things. Right. Basically, all act to stifle innovation. Yeah. So that's why the consulting industry created innovation consulting to make up <laughs> for all the other stuff that they did. Yeah, I can say that because I was a management consultant for quite a number of years. Yeah, But um, I think the... Um, if I think about the companies where I was able to do things in a truly innovative way, a handful of times in larger organizations where the CEO had a vision, he said, go do this. Yeah, You're yeah. going to be my guy to go do this. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm, you've got the funding to do it. Go make it happen. And yeah. that works. Yeah, yeah. That can work well. Um, you have to truly divorce yourself from the rest of the organization. Right. Uh, because if you have to go report into the HR department or you can't hire these kinds of people to do these new jobs that nobody else hires, yeah. it's not going to work because yeah. it's a round peg square hole thing. Right. Um, I think, uh, you know, even in an organization um, as big as T-Mobile, uh, when I was in T-Mobile, uh, I was responsible for the Pacific Northwest at T-Mobile as a VP and general manager there. We were able to do some innovative things. There was a lot of structure. It was put on us, so we we had our hands tied in some areas. But you know the the idea of um, running a speed test for a mobile phone and for data was uh -huh. something that originated with my team in the Pacific Northwest at T-Mobile, and we just sort of thought outside the box. Yeah, and yeah. it was one of the things where you talk to the senior execs in the company and say, "Well, okay, but don't screw it up because it's going to be really bad." really bad if, <laughs> if you do. Right. But, um, you know, we did it, we pulled it off, and we kind of won, won against the big guys on that marketing innovation. That's so right. it can be done. Uh, I just think if you really love to do the new thing, if you really love to innovate, you're really going to need to be in smaller organizations or better yet, your own. Ultimately, when you have the skills to do that, right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, let, let me tell you about this debate that kind of uh, may, may, people don't maybe know about, it, but it's in the academic community, mm -hmm. and, it, and it sort of has to do with, um, I would you could say blue sky innovation on one side, where people are uh, you could call it the Google model, where yeah. they they say twenty percent of your time to just dream about whatever you want, versus the more um, uh, I would say uh, you could even say almost command and control world of right. management says. Here's a deadline. You guys need to solve a pro solve a specific problem with a specific deadline by this time. Right. Uh, in your opinion, can you comment on either one? Or would you... I can see, I can see benefits to both. Yeah. Um, I think that um, 
The benefits to the command and control are going to be that you'll probably achieve incremental improvement in your industry and stay ahead of the other guys, yeah. more than likely. Yeah. I think the blue sky thing is interesting. I don't think it's probably as effective in, it, it's almost like the adult version of unstructured play, right? Right, <laughs> right, right, exactly right. Exactly so right. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'd be interested to see how much of innovation has come out of Google from blue sky thinking like yeah, that. Yeah, um, yeah. I suspect that it's maybe not that much, but I could be wrong. Um, I think that if you have something, like we're as a team, we're responsible for this company and we yeah. take that very seriously. And it's not just responsible for the assets and the investors and that kind of thing, but it's also the ultimate uh, outcome in medicine, right? Because yeah, yeah. all of us have been touched by these diseases of the eye in one, fa in one fashion or another. Yeah. And I think when you have that kind of motivation, then your blue sky thinking tends to be directed, personally directed, uh -huh. self-directed, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And it doesn't mean that you limit what you might do, but it does mean that you have an end in mind. Yeah, and I right. think that's important in that blue sky world is it, so what, why are we doing this? What's the end in mind? Yeah. And I'm sure there are examples of innovation where somebody just sat back and did the you know dream under a tree, and the apple right. hit them on the head, and they discovered <laughs> gravity, sort of thing. But I, yeah. I, I think that's much more rare. Yeah, that's right. Right, that's right. You know, it's uh, I, I told you over lunch that one of the classes that I'm designing for next year is called Moonshots. And it's focused on this radical blue sky right. innovation, right. partly because it's kind of understudied in our society. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I think the capital markets are they're better at uh, incentivizing smaller steps yes. than kind of the, the really blank sheet. Well, they're, they're better at incentivizing smaller steps with things that are well understood. Yeah, exactly yes, right. right. Exactly right. And, uh, and universities are somewhat better, but even universities are actually still yeah. pretty incremental yeah. because... You know, a lot of journals are asking for what's, they literally ask, what is the incremental contribution <laughs> of, the, of this paper? <laughs> and so they don't even shy yeah. away from it. I've seen that in the peer review process yeah, for our own published that, papers. Yes, that. right. I've seen that. That's right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something I'm personally curious about, yeah. uh, the moonshots versus, and both are important for society. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, but but if you're anyone watching, uh, we will uh, announce the class for next spring on, on moonshots. Um, let me let me now, uh, you know, looking back at your career, mm -hmm. uh, let's let's kind of wind back to your time at Texas A and M. Right. The university has changed a lot since, sure since you've been here. Yes. But um, I guess what what uh, what can you comment on your education uh, and how A and M can do better uh, now, right. given what you know about your career path and all the, the lessons? You've had? Well, I'm certainly not an expert on A and M today, so um, I, I, I I hesitate to say you should do this and that and the other differently yeah. here at the university. I mean, I, I I think what I loved about coming here and being here is um, it gave me an opportunity to learn how to work hard in my education because um, at the time, and we won't say those years, but um, my high school time was really easy. Uh -huh. And I was the guy that, you know, cut my last class or two in the afternoon to drive down to the beach every, every day of my senior year living in Houston. And um, when I got to A&M, it was a rude awakening because yeah. it was like sink or swim, ridiculously hard, challenging courses. And I was behind the curve on math the entire time I was here. I was learning mathematical concepts that would have been great to have known last semester when I was in my this engineering course. Yeah. And I think that um, that was valuable for me, right? Uh -huh. I mean, that, you know, I figure if I can stand up to this, I can just about stand up to anything. And I think that was a great uh, way to do it. I think the other thing that was cool for me about the university, about A&M and being an Aggie is that there's something about this place that is very, very different from other universities, right? Uh -huh. A lot of things that sound corny to an outsider, but become really meaningful to you when you go here. And uh, I think that feeling of community is frankly unique uh, and it's recognized by other people. Yeah. Uh, they see it as unique whenever they're exposed to it. And uh, my younger brother came here. He had a similar academic experience uh -huh. to mine. He nearly flunked out and then he did well and he got out and he's been very successful in his life. Yeah. And um, I know a lot of people who've come here and, and really enjoyed it. And I think the university has been able to maintain that unique flavor. And I would say yeah. that that's something that should be yeah. something that they put a, put a shoulder behind because it really, it gives you another reason to be here other than just grinding it out to get the degree. Right. 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 It yeah. really does. And that, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, I'm always looking for the, the extra oomph. Why am I here? Right. I could yeah. do, I could do this activity anywhere. Why would I do it here? Right. And that's it. 
I think. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it, is, it definitely is a special place, yeah. and we need to keep it that way. Yeah, agree. Over time. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now uh, to the to the students in the audience, mm-hmm. uh, what what advice would you have to them? Uh, Again, based on your career yeah. and life, life lessons. Yeah, I, well, someone we talked about. I, I, I think that if you are interested in innovation as a, something that you want to try to tackle, uh, oftentimes it's applied, you have an area that you want to do it in, I think you need to uh, just dedicate yourself to surrounding that topic. Yeah. You just need to understand it top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, I think that developing skills in multiple disciplines is important. The, my engineering background's been hugely helpful to me from a, just understanding te- technical topics and having a depth, a basic technical depth. But um, getting a grad degree in business was pretty valuable to, for me too because it helped me to understand the motivations behind the people that actually write the checks and uh, what makes sense for somebody and how um, the trajectory of something matters, right? You can, you can be a great innovator, but if you're going too slowly, someone else is going to do it before you and it's right. just not going to work. Right. And I think that knowing, knowing those things and having those multiple skill sets really helps you be there. And then I think there's a social element to it as well. Because if you're innovating, you're selling something. You're selling the new thing. You're selling something different. And right. as we talked about, people are very comfortable with the way things are today. Yeah. They really don't want to hear about the new thing. Right. So right. what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to communicate what's new and different about this, why it should matter, why it's going to be so much better if you're able to pull this off. And that entails some, you know, you've got to learn social skills. You've got to learn what makes the other person tick. You've got to get inside their head. Yeah. And those are skills that are... Um, those are hard won skills, frankly, and they take time to develop. But those are the kind of things that I would say make the most sense for people that want to pursue new things, pursue their own business, pursue um, innovation in a particular field. Okay. And, and uh, do you believe that more students should want to do that? Is that something that we can pick? Uh, do you think students can? That's a, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, or let's say someone's on the fence. How do yeah. they? How do they know? How well, my wife would say not everybody needs to be like you. So uh, <laughs> that's what she, that's she, that's what she would tell me, and she's yeah. right about that. I think it's not for everybody. Um, right. You know, I think people have different emotional makeup. They learn differently. They um, have different aspirations and uh, different ambitions. And some people are have just a burning desire to move things forward and go get things done. And those people probably fit into that category. And that doesn't mean that the other folks are not, uh, not good or adequate or great in the the area that they choose to pursue. It just means that that's, that's one of the things that's probably required and you have to be willing to do it. Were you, did you know you were, that was you when you were in college or did you discover that over time? I think I knew that I didn't want to do the thing that everybody else did. I uh-huh. wanted to do different, and uh-huh. uh, I knew that early on. Um, uh, my my dad, who I admire greatly, he and I kind of were, you know, kind of at each other off right. and on, you know, during my teenage years. And I was not the easiest guy to get along with when I was in high school and college. And I think that um, I wanted to go do something different. I wanted yeah. to blaze a new trail, yeah. and there, there was a motivator there. Um, yeah. uh, you know, as much as I admired and learned from him, he also provided me with kind of the impetus to go out and get new right. things, do something different, blaze my own path. Some of it's forced upon you, right? You go into a job and you think naively when you're young that oh, I'm going to be here forever, and then you look around and you think I don't want to be here that as long as that guy is to get that job. Right. I'm going to move on and do something differently. Right. So right. ambition plays a role too, yeah. I think. Um, but yeah, I think probably early on I knew okay. kind of, I yeah. was going to try to do something different Yeah, and, yeah. and I keep trying it until I get it right. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, well, just some, some background on A&M, you know, mm-hmm. one thing that, uh, one thing, I don't know how this was when, when you were here, but, uh, you know, right now A&M does a, it does an excellent job bringing, providing broad-based education right. across the state, right. uh, to people, many of whom have never come to, to college before. And, uh, and it also does a great job, you know, if, if you want to get a job at Deloitte, for example, mm-hmm. uh, here, here at A&M, it's, they, we will lay out the path for yep. you. You know, you just yep. kind of, here are the steps you need to take. Yep. But if you want to do something different, it's actually a lot harder. And I've talked to a lot of those students. Right. And, and part of what I'm doing in this, this, this show, as well as the center, mm-hmm. is to provide that, that, that network, that yep. support network, uh, and that, that, that connect the dots for the students yep. to help them, help them along to... To provide so that they can have those options too, if they uh, well, and when I was here, the placement center was where you went, and right. your dad told you you better go get a job, go to the placement center because the checks are going to stop. That was usually what <laughs> happened, right? Yeah. And it's um, 
still very common, right? right. And, I, and I think that's, uh, that's the, the mentality of the university as a, um, uh, a job creating entity, right? right? right. Uh, or an employee creating entity, entity right. perhaps more accurately. That's right. And not exactly necessarily right. as um, uh, something that gave you a classical education. You know, we had, in our country, when we had our founding, we had people who were classically educated and they did all kinds of crazy things. Oh, they right. all by themselves, right? They were oh, innovators yeah. Yeah, yeah, every yeah. single day. They were they the had ultimate to be. founders. They literally. had to be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin, Franklin right? Adams, yeah. all of those guys yeah, all yeah. had, um, you know, interesting careers. I mean, no, there wasn't a law school everybody went to. You sat right. and read law under somebody that's if that's right. what you wanted. That's right. And I, and I think that... Um, Finding a way to get back to that probably create will will that's a way to maybe expand innovation in right. my opinion. Right, yeah. right. Well, we we definitely I definitely appreciate your voice on this show because Thanks. because it's part of our longer term mission to encourage more students to to be as innovative as possible in their Great. in their life and their careers. So appreciate so thank you, Eric, for yeah. taking the time to uh, to visit us. Yeah. and for sitting down and sharing your story. And uh, we look forward to hosting you uh, in, in Aggieland once again. Beautiful. Thanks a lot. Okay. Great to see everybody. Thank you.